Hi, my name is Carrie Fox, and I'm here to talk to you about how to put together a great National History Day paper or a website. So we are going to look at papers first. Um, for me, whenever I'm starting a big project, I want to know how I'm being assessed at the end of that project. So I always look at how it will be evaluated. So um, take a look at the rubric, spend some time with it, read the different blocks, and see what that means for how you're going to construct your project, your paper. Um, you can find the rubric as well as many other resources at National History Day, uh, their website, nhd.org. It's very useful. There are three parts to that rubric that you probably want to keep in mind. The first is the parameters. The parameters, if you think about it, if you've ever seen a floor competition in gymnastics where the gymnast steps out of bounds um, and they get a big deduction to their score, that's what a parameter is. So you want to make sure that you're inside the parameters on your paper and your website. Um, for the paper, you can't use less than 1,500 words or more than 2,500 words for your paper. Um, you must have citations and you must have a process paper and an annotated bibliography with your paper. So those are all requirements and if you miss out on those, um, it will deeply impact the score that you're able to receive. You also need to make sure that you have the word counts for your paper and your process paper on the title page. All of those things are detailed. If you take a look at the paper uh, instructions on National History Day's website. 20% of your evaluation is based on style so that's not a huge amount. Um, the vast majority of what you will be evaluated on is based on your thinking and your work, but the way you present that information is very important as well. There's two different um, categories for the style, and one is technical. So the technical, your citations uh, must be correctly formatted, and there's a specific way to do that. Uh, you can get information about that from your teacher. You can also look online or check out National History Day's website as well. Um, your quotations and paraphrasing must also be cited in the paper, and that's a really important part of doing history that you'll take with you beyond just this project. You will use this um, procedure for how to cite the material of other people's work in your work in many other instances in high school and in college. So it's important to know. That's why it's in here. Uh, the other part that you will be thinking about as you are presenting your information is the, the way you write. And that is very important in a research paper. Um, you want to make sure that you have writing that is clear and understandable. It's probably better to write comfortably with the words that you know what they mean, rather than try to reach for big four-syllable, five-syllable words. Um, generally, most people do a great job when you're, they are using the words that they are comfortable with to explain um, their ideas. So keep that in mind so that your writing comes across and is easy to understand. Additionally, you want to avoid grammatical mistakes and you want to avoid mechanical errors. So that would be like your margins are totally off or something like that. So you want to keep an eye out for that. It's always a great idea to have somebody take a look at your paper and if there's a word that you missed or something like that, they can uh, mark that and have you go back and look and assess what needs to be done. So that is the style section of the rubric and you want to keep that in mind as you are beginning your paper and as you are polishing your paper. Your paper is not going to be something you just write once and forget about. You'll have to go over it uh, multiple times in order to create the product that you think best explains your voice.
Now we're looking at content, and the content is a very important part because that is the work of history, and that's what National History Day is all about, is being a historian. So we're gonna look at some things that historians do on a regular basis. Um, they may not be totally familiar to you, and that is absolutely okay. We are introducing the idea now, and if you find something that you don't know well, you can always go through and study up on it, basically. So uh, this is just an overview meant to give you an idea of the things that you'll be thinking about as you do your research and construct your paper. So the first thing, the central thing that all historians do is they create a historical argument. Now, a lot of times people think that that's what they start out with, but I say that you really have to educate yourself on your topic first before you know kind of what questions are out there and the answers to those research questions are your historical argument. It's basically the thing that you're trying to prove with all the information that you are sharing with your reader. Your argument should be connected to the theme because um, this is the National History Day competition and the theme is very important. If you don't connect to the theme, which is communication in history, you are not communicating very well. So you wanna keep that in mind, especially this year. Your claim has got to be proven. So it's easy to say things that happened in history or your view of what happened, but you have got to prove it with facts and analysis. So how you interpret those facts um, is gonna be the bulk of your paper. So that is the historical argument piece and it's really central to your writing. Uh, a good thesis, a good historical argument will take you far. So spend some time on that and work on refining it. The next thing that you want to be thinking about as you embark on your paper project is the research that you're gonna undertake in order to understand your topic and to make yourself an expert. So you wanna do a lot of research. You should read books on your topic. That is absolutely the case. You may not read an entire book, but if you see a chapter that's on a topic that is related to your topic, then you want to make sure that you're reading that. Additionally, you want to do a wide variety of research. So that means you're going to be looking for not just books and articles online, you're going to be looking for magazine articles from the past. You'll be looking in online databases. You'll be looking at archives from different institutions. You might find interviews or uh, news stories that have been broadcast that are related to your topic. And all of those things are things that you should be considering and looking at as you educate yourself about your topic. One special thing that you wanna be on the lookout for because it's very, very important in National History Day projects and as your work as a historian are primary sources. Primary sources and their use in your work is something that you wanna get used to doing because that is the work of the historian. So from the National History Day website, they define a primary source as a piece of information about a historical event and period in which the creator of the source was an actual participant in or a contemporary of a historical moment. So the way I think about that is the person that created the thing that you are looking at, were they involved with the event, the idea, the policy, the people that you are looking at for your topic? So um, that is what should guide you in trying to understand whether one of the sources that you're looking at is a primary source or a secondary source. A secondary source is not, is something other than a direct connection to the event, the person, the idea, um, or the policy. So there are so many examples of what a primary source is, and I think it may intimidate people when they think of primary sources just as like letters that people sent to each other. But depending on your topic, you may find 
um, a wide variety of primary sources that you hadn't considered. Um, objects, artifacts from that time period can be a primary source. Documents, of course. Um, pieces of artwork like songs and um, visual art, those can be primary sources depending on your topic. I spend a lot of time with gov government documents and reports and the work that I do. Uh, and many historians spend their time looking at different data sets. Um, that's kind of a new area of history and uh, it's fun and interesting. You can think about data sets as being city directories or census bureau, bureau data, um, weather information, all of those things you can work with and those are primary sources that you can use and cite. Additionally, think about media. Those things, if it documents the event that you're looking at at the time, um, that is a primary source. So if you find a news uh, program or you find an interview that features your topic, then that might be a primary source. So there's a wealth of them out, of, out there. You just have to be attuned to understanding what a primary source is as you are using them. The whole goal of what a historian does and what you are doing with your paper project is using primary sources to prove your argument. Secondary sources are great. They help you understand things. But if you really want to excel as a historian, you will base your argument primarily on primary sources because there's no confusion as to how it was interpreted other than by you. So, Other elements to consider as you are working on your paper project, it, the big one is historical context. Historical context is critical in including in your paper project because then people understand how we got to the place that we are in what you're describing. So context helps to explain events and how people respond to them. And context includes both long-term causes and short-term catalysts. So when you're thinking about an event, you can ask, what is the thing that caused this to happen? And then you can also ask yourself, what is the thing that caused this to happen in this particular place with these particular people? So an example that I'll give you is the Montgomery bus boycott. A long-term cause, the long-term cause of the Montgomery bus boycott is Jim Crow segregation in the South and how that worked on public transit. However, that took place all over the South. So why is it that it happened in Montgomery? Well, it happened in Montgomery because of the catalyst that happened um, to make this event happen. So um, the reason it happened in Montgomery is because Rosa Parks got fed up and she refused to get up and give her seat away. And that caused her to be arrested and that caused the people of Montgomery to respond with a year-long protest against something they had been angry about for a really long time. So you can see there how there was something kind of big and pervasive that was the cause of this response to segregation. However, the reason why it happened was because of the catalysts, Rosa Parks, um, the rules in Montgomery. So keep that in mind as you are considering the context of how the people in your topic are responding to events. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is what perspective should I be considering? Um, there is not one way to look at an event or an idea or a policy. Um, that debate is really what makes history interesting because you can compare uh, and discern and decide what you think is correct. So multiple pers perspectives is something you should integrate into your paper. Um, if you think about it, uh, there is certainly one narrative of the land runs in Oklahoma when many settlers came here and were granted, granted parcels of land and were able to begin successful farms in many cases. 
Um, however, that is not the only perspective that is related to the land runs. If you think about those different tribal nations that had held that land previously, they most certainly have a different perspective on the situation. And you can uncover what those are. Um, you can then compare how different people, different groups of people are looking at the same event. And that really helps you understand kind of the complexity of that event. So um, that's an interesting part of being a historian, most definitely. Another thing that you want to consider, and you've probably heard this from other teachers, is historical accuracy. You want to ensure that the material you're using to build your project um, are, are sources that are credible or believable. Typically, people will use, the way they create a source will help determine uh, how credible it is. So if they only talk to one person and it's a lot of opinion that, about an event, then that is not going to be as credible as if the person who is presenting this argument has looked at a wide variety of resources, looked at multiple perspectives, documented all of those so that if somebody wanted to, they could go back and check those sources to see if they agreed with how those sources were being interpreted and uh, put that in their published material for the end reader to use. So you wanna make sure that you are trying to be as accurate as possible um, and be careful when you explain statistics. Make sure that if statistics are great to use, they're very helpful in kind of grabbing a snapshot of a situation, but at the same time, you wanna make sure that you are interpreting the statistic well, and uh, that might be worth a conversation with somebody who understands data and can help you uh, with your insight into that information. So um, just make sure you, you are explaining your statistics, your numbers well, if you're using them. And then the other thing is you want to make sure that you're including, um, again, those multiple perspectives and the context. Those things, if you leave out a central context, um, you can't fully understand the event and it is presented inaccurately. So if you think about it, there was something called the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962 and it was a big conflict between the United States and Cuba, and things got very tense. Well, that is important information and specific and accurate about the Cuban Missile Crisis, but if you're writing a paper on the Cuban Missile Crisis, then you want to make sure that you are including information uh, that talks about why that happened. So if you don't talk about the Bay of Pigs, you've left something out and made your paper less accurate. So I encourage you to make sure that you're doing a complete job and you are um, reviewing the sources that you are using with a pretty critical eye to make sure that you're using good sources. Another thing to think about as you are working on the content of your paper is the significance. Um, that is something that is um, pretty central in how we look at history because so much has happened. And if we don't pick things that we think are important, then um, we will just get buried in details. So we have to select topics that have significance I like to say, why are we talking about this instead of what Farmer John did in 1862 in October? So why is it this topic causes us to stop and take a look at it with the limited amount of time that we have? So you're going to have to make a strong argument for why your topic is significant. Um, oftentimes, significance in history is something that shows a major change. It shows how it is a great example of something 
or it sets up a series of events that leads to a major event later on. A good example of that is the Great Migration. The Great Migration is the movement of African Americans out of the South beginning in the 1890s, but going all the way up to the 1970s. And they uh, tended to settle in northern cities. There's a lot of reasons why that happened, but one of those reasons is because they lacked the right to vote in the South, so they couldn't arrange things how they, they thought their leaders should provide for their lives. So what they elected to do instead was to leave because they had been closed off from the political process. Well, what ended up happening is the Great Migration will lead to the Civil Rights Movement in a very real way because it has groups of people spread throughout the country who now care about what's happening in the South and they have access to the political process. So they are able to put in political leaders that can respond to those things that are happening, happening in the South related to segregation that they disagree with. So the Great Migration is a good example of how something led to something else. And it's a great topic to explore. It's very interesting because it has multiple significances. The last thing that you want to think about is your voice. So there was a reason why you elected to pick this topic and spend this time and learn all this stuff. So your job, and it's an important job, is to tell us what you think, not what other people think. But as you have made yourself an expert, well, we want to hear what the expert thinks. So make sure that you are telling us not what you think the reader wants to hear, but absolutely what you think after all the work that you have done. So make sure that your voice is woven throughout your paper. Um, otherwise, really, what's the point? So you want to make sure that you are using your student voice. So that is information on how to construct a paper for the National History Day competition. I wish you the best of luck. There are a ton of resources on uh, both the Oklahoma History Center website, okhistory.org, and the National History Day website, you will find basically the answer to any question that you can think of as you get started on your project and as you are working your way through it. I wish you the best of luck. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about websites. And um, we will not review the content. Uh, if you're interested in breaking down kind of the content that you'll be assessed on uh, with regards to your project, your website project for National History Day, then the first thing you want to do is take a look at uh, the rubric that you can find on nhd.org or you can also take a look at the information on how to build a paper and just ignore the part about the paper creation and look at the content section and that will give you kind of a summary of these different elements that you'll see in the website rubric under content. With regards to a website, the first thing that you want to do is have a conversation with yourself about how you're going to do the hard part first. The fun part of building a website is most assuredly picking all the pictures and creating the design and figuring out how you want it to be presented. And that is a very important part of your story in your website for your National History Day project. But if you don't do the hard part first, which is the history, then you won't have a very competitive website. Because the core part of doing this work is figuring out how to research a topic, become an expert on a topic, 
and then present that topic. So two of those things have to do with um, the research part. So you want to make sure that you're conducting your research and you have written your first draft before you even think about building your website. Um, it's pretty critical to keep yourself on a good timeline. You want to take a look at how much time you have before the project needs to be completed. And you want to create deadlines for yourself that you observe and give you enough time to do a good job on all the different elements. Because you don't want to get into a situation where you've done a great job on the research and the writing and you didn't give yourself enough time for the design. So absolutely make sure you are building in enough time for yourself to do all three of those things. When a judge looks at your website, they'll be taking 80% of their score from your content, which is the hard part. It's the research and the writing. So what you learn, the argument that you have, and how you present that information is more important than the style and the design. Um, so make sure you attend to that well. The style part is important though for a website because it's so visual and it can tell a story in a really unique way. Um, so you, you wanna take advantage of those benefits that building a website offers you and do a great job with that. And that will be assessed with the style section which is 20% of your score. Another thing that you wanna keep in mind as you're building your research and developing your argument and writing is as you go through and you see maybe a photograph of somebody that's involved in your topic or a piece of media that was particularly important as you developed your argument, then you wanna keep track. Um, save those links and maybe keep a little notebook of sources that you come across that would be very useful in constructing your website. So that way you're not having to search to go find that picture of Billie Holiday or whatever. So um, keep that in mind as you begin your project and you'll save some time on the back end. The next thing that you wanna do, because websites are visual, you wanna think about how it's gonna be laid out. And for some people, they can do that with just a typical outline that you've probably learned in English class. But for other people, they need to take a, a different approach. So some people will storyboard their project um, and kind of draw out what that looks like and add notes and things. Um, you can also use a site map and there's a link for a great sample site map at the bottom of this slide. Um, and that site map will help you lay out where you're gonna put everything. It'll help you think about all the different elements you need to have on every single page. So um, this is a critical step. You don't wanna skip over that and just kind of wing the creation of your website or else you're probably gonna miss some important details. So definitely take a look at um, each types of these forms of organizers and see which one would work best for you. The other thing to keep in mind is the way you organize your information may not be the best the first time out. You may have to substantially change or alter how you're presenting your information. So be open to trying different things. Um, if on your third try, you may find exactly what you were trying to do. And since the theme for this year is all about communication, it's well worth your time to figure out how to communicate and what you've learned about your topic, your arguments, and how you defend that argument, um, how to do that well. So be open to making big changes. You want to remember that your homepage has some required information, and without that, you're um, possibly going to suffer a major deduction in the competition part of National History Day. And if that's the case, it's just a simple mistake to avoid. So you don't want to um, make that mistake. Double check, triple check that you have the required information on your homepage. And just in general, as you're thinking about how you're constructing your web page, um, you're gonna have big blocks and those big blocks of information 
are all going to correspond to a main idea. Um, this is probably something you're familiar with as you write um, stories and papers for your English class. And so your main ideas when you build your website are going to be their own pages. That's a good preliminary way to think about how to construct a web page in a way that somebody that is not you can follow what you're trying to say. The content of those pages will be um, basically the evidence that you found, the historical information that you found that proves your point. And you're going to explain why that information proves your point. That's called analysis. And it's a pretty important part of being a historian. So you want to make sure that you have evidence and analysis on each of your pages. This part is really fun. Um, as you are getting ready to start your design, you can take a look at other websites and kind of with a critical eye look at those websites. What do you like about this website? What doesn't work for you? What are some features that you've never seen on this website that you might be able to uh, incorporate into your design? So keep that in mind and take a tour of the internet. There's a couple of different things that I would recommend that you take a look at. Number one, you want to take a look at the winning examples of websites at National History Day's website. Um, you can see what they did in order to convey their information in a way that uh, awarded them a, a prize. So take a look at those. And then the other thing that you can do is take a look at websites that um, folks who are in website design have decided are uh, really attractive and are well done. So you can just search for web uh, website showcases and take a look at them. Um, there's numerous ones and see which websites you like and which websites you don't like. Uh, it'll help you to get the ideas that you need in order to build the website that you want to for your topic. And then the other thing that you might consider before you get started is uh, taking a look at color palettes. So some colors don't go together with other colors and you want, number one, your website to be pleasing to the eye. So color palettes help you to see how the colors work all together. And if you are looking at color palettes that have the RGB or the hex code, which you can search and see what that means if you are not sure, um, then you can just type that into your website builder and you'll go exactly to that color. So um, that's a kind of a useful tip, I think. Some other tips and tricks to consider is you may not have the skills that you need in order to build the website that you want. And there's plenty of resources available for you. The National History Day website has tutorials on every aspect of building a website. Uh, I can tell you that I have built several websites before and I did not know automatically how to build a website in the website builder. So you will want to make sure that you educate yourself on that part as well. But the great thing is once you get done and you have learned that information, then you know how to build a website and you'll be able to do it whenever you need to, maybe in your work or as a hobby. So um, it's a great skill to have, especially um, now. So the other thing that I would recommend is Especially if you don't have strong experience building a website, if you're not somebody who's done the website category for four years in a row and feels very, very comfortable building a website, is when you make changes, you want to go to that preview button to see how that affected everything. You do not want to build an entire page and then discover there was some like thing in the middle of it that you did that caused everything to go sideways and you don't know which of the several actions that you took caused that catastrophic end result. So you wanna make sure that you're testing frequently to make sure that it is formatting the way that you want it to be. Another thing to consider as you are developing your design is you wanna make sure that your elements 
and your style and your colors um, kind of reinforce your theme and your arguments and your topic. So if you are doing the dust bowl, then you might consider a color palette that's brown, just to kind of embed in that reader's head, ah, uh, this is about dust, this is about dirt. So um, there's all kinds of things that you can do. If you're looking at the history of graffiti in uh, the United States, then you are probably going to pick a color palette that pops because uh, it's bold and colorful. You wouldn't want to go with beiges and browns in that instance. So be mindful of your topic and pair your style choices to that topic. There's a checklist on National History Day uh, website that helps you kind of manage all these elements. It's a lot of stuff to think about, building the information, doing the research, and then creating a website that is many plates to spin. And if you need some help with that, that checklist will, will do a great service to you. And then the last thing to talk about is the kind of do's and don'ts that would have a major impact on your score if you kind of do if you do these things. So um, your definite don'ts is you can't have more than 1,200 student-created words on your site. You can have other words that are quotations uh, from other folks, but the things that you are writing from your brain, that is 1,200 words only, um, and you don't want to exceed that. You can't link to any external site. So if you see a great example of something that you want the person who's reading your site, you've got to figure out a way to embed that on your site rather than to click on a link and have it open up to another website. So it has to be on your website. And then your multimedia, so your clips, your music, things like that, um, those things cannot add up to more than three minutes. So you could have one clip that is two minutes and um, 59 seconds, or you could have several smaller ones that add up to that amount, but you can't exceed three minutes. As far as musts are concerned, there's only a few, but you want to make sure that you have them because they're pretty critical as the judge is evaluating your product. Um, your homepage must have the required information. It's not a lot of information, but it's specific and it's an easy thing to do, so make sure you don't miss out on that. And then you must have your process paper and your annotated bibliography embedded as PDFs on your site. If you don't know how to do that, um, you will find tons of instructions on that on National History Day or with the search, but they must be on the website as PDFs. And then, absolutely, if you are creating a historical product, you must cite your visuals and your quotes. Uh, it would be academically dishonest not to, and that is a very important element in how we communicate with each other. We want to make sure that the work that is not ours is credited to the person it belongs to. So make sure that you're citing uh, the material that you are using from someone else. Websites are fun to make. Uh, you get a lot of choice in how the final product looks, so I really encourage you to make the best of this project. You can do some amazing things, and I wish you great luck as you embark on this process.